So you know what a Lagrangian is now, and you know how to use it to do calculations. You get your Euler-Lagrange equations, which are implicit second-order differential equations. The problem with that, of course, is that sometimes you want explicit equations to make things easier, and you also ideally would like first-order equations, so that the initial condition that you have for your variables is exactly what you need to describe your whole system. And in order to do that, we have to look at something called the Hamiltonian. We'll start just by defining the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is a function of the generalized coordinates for our system, just like the Lagrangian, but instead of the time derivative of these coordinates, it's also a function of the momenta instead. Okay, let's remind ourselves of the momentum before we go on. Remember, the momentum corresponding to the jth coordinate is just the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of that coordinate. Okay. So the Hamiltonian, and I won't use vector notation, I'll do the explicit sum, is the sum of the time derivatives of Q times the momentum of Pj minus the Lagrangian. And remember, of course, the Lagrangian is defined in terms of Qs and Q dots. So when you write it this way, you actually have to convert your coordinates from Q dots back to the Ps. And they will be related through that. Okay, so that's the definition of our Hamiltonian. Now, if I wanted to take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to something, I would have to use, because it's a function of so many variables, I would have to use the multivariable chain rule. And so the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to something would be the partial derivatives, and again, I'll use explicit things, of the Hamiltonian with respect to the coordinates, times the derivative of the coordinate with respect to something, plus the partial derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momenta times the derivative of the momentum with respect to something plus the explicit partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to time and the derivative of time with respect to that thing. So we've written this out in terms of the increments here and that would be true for any total derivative. That's just expanding out from the left hand side. We could also do the same thing from the right hand side. So let's do that. So from this first term here, we'll get a product rule so we'll have sum of j qj dot dpj with respect to uh, whatever the variable is and the other term from the product rule pj dqj dot and then we'll also have to expand this so it's a function of all the q's so we'll have all of those we'll also have the qj dots and finally of course the explicit time derivative now we'll notice immediately, of course, that we've got two dqj dot terms. And we'll also notice that this is precisely the definition of pj, so in fact that should be pj, which means that these two are exactly equal and opposite, so they cancel. And we're left with the remaining three. This one here, from the Euler-Lagrange equation, we know that this is ddt of pj. And so if we rewrite it that way, there we go. These two lines are simultaneously true, no matter what we're taking the derivative with respect to. And therefore, each of these individual terms must be equal. And that means we immediately have the relations. We know that the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to time is equal and opposite to the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time, explicitly. We also know that pj dot is just minus the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to qj, and we know that qj dot is just the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to pj. So what we've just derived is we've derived the equations of motion for a system based on the Hamiltonian alone. So we don't need the Lagrangian anymore. If we have the Hamiltonian, we can immediately get how our coordinates evolve. Now note that we've got p's and q's here. Now we always had the q's, we used to have q dots. In fact, we always needed to know the initial values of the q dots because the Euler-Lagrange equations gave us second order differential equations for which you need to know the derivatives as well as the initial values in order to solve. So here we've just kind of made that explicit. We've got the q's and the p's as our initial conditions and the time derivative of those is almost symmetric as you can see, the derivative of the Hamiltonian respect to one or the other. And there's just this minus sign breaking the symmetry there. Remember in Lagrangian mechanics, if the Lagrangian didn't depend on the coordinate, then the conjugate momentum was constant. Well, here we have exactly the same thing. If the Hamiltonian does not depend on the coordinate, and that is called, if it is cyclic, then the momentum is constant. 
And indeed, in Hamiltonian mechanics, you can talk about the symmetric situation, which is the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on the momenta, then also the coordinates are constant.